Hello, I'm Hans Lee from Live Wire Markets and welcome to Views from the Top. Our guest today is Andrew McCaffrey, the Global Chief Investment Officer for Fidelity International. And as if you needed any proof that Livewire attracts the best investors and the most experienced investors in the world, Andrew started in the markets in October 1983, but he has been with Fidelity in the global CIO role since 2019. Great to have you out here from London, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Hans. Good to be with you. So I mentioned there more than 40 years in the market, so I thought I'd start with this question. What is the one major change you have seen in markets in your time? And maybe what is the one thing that isn't really different this time? So I think that one of the things that I would see as being actually the more constant um, throughout is that the ability to do excellent analysis and understand the true dynamics of what makes a good investment idea work, whether that be looking at a company and understanding what can drive you know, buying a stock or even looking and understanding the credit buying a, a bond or any form of asset class, is that that value really has not changed. You may have adapted and evolved, but at its core, that ability to have that analysis and really a deep understanding has not changed in terms of the value that can come from that. Most probably the biggest change in some ways is that just the growth, the liquidity of markets and the way in which we have a, a growth in terms of asset classes and um, the ways in which you can both manage risk and take exposure uh, in markets has been phenomenal. And you know, that's driven a number of other trends that uh, have come out. I think that when I look at um, investors, you know, they've also become incredibly knowledgeable, well-resourced, um, and also much more focused on what they want to uh, achieve. And therefore, for an asset manager, that means we've got to adapt more and uh, be able to understand those needs much more closely than maybe we did you know, 10, 20 years ago. So that was then. Uh, let's focus on now and into the, the future if we can. I do know that the 2024 outlook from Fidelity International is centered around this idea that we are in a new paradigm. But what do you think is the most important change within this paradigm that investors need to be across? So I think that 2024 actually is um, going to be driven by the starting um, um, point of uh, actually things that we've seen many times have been quite encouraging. So disinflationary profile is going to accelerate for several months. Growth is going to continue, even if it's decelerated in some areas that we've seen actually improvement in some parts of the of the world. So that's quite a positive um, framework. But the, the new paradigm re is really more about a longer term perspective of which 24 may actually in some ways be a little bit of a holding pattern where we get good things from looking at the great moderation pre-COVID, um, but moving to one where we think over time, average levels of inflation will actually be higher. Some of the structural trends, decarbonisation, reshoring in the developed world, uh, elements even of seeing labour and um, capital ratios uh, change. And these will all, over time, give a slightly more um, inflationary bias. Um, but that's something for later and, and what the consequences are for, for debt and for um, the returns on financial assets. But as we start 24, I think it's important to focus on the good things. You know, yeah. Disinflation, interest rate policy easing, um, and an economy that you know, in many countries continues to move um, in a positive fashion. So in this outlook, you and, and the team talk about four scenarios uh, that could take place in markets. And we'll put up that graphic for the audience who's watching. So you've got there the cyclical recession, you've got a balance sheet recession, the soft landing, and the no landing. I thought. What was interesting about that was that I think you put a cyclical recession, a run-of-the-mill recession there at about 60%. So how do you quantify, if you like, the unquantifiable? And why would you give such a huge weighting to a, a regular run-of-the-mill recession when markets are pricing in a soft landing? So uh, the exciting thing is I can tell you that we've actually changed those probabilities ah, um, because okay. we've had our annual analyst survey output in the recent uh, weeks. And what that did was actually throw out some really interesting insights from the sort of companies we talk to. So we have 20,000 company meetings every year with management. And uh, also we have a regular monthly survey, but then an annual survey, which is a much deeper dive, much bigger um, uh, sort of questionnaire. And in that, we look at what's happening to those companies now and what they see as the world around them and how they're responding and what they see 12 months out. And the parts that looked very important, sort of looking at an aggregate level, was that the disinflation force is still remarkably strong. Therefore, when we look at things like non-labour costs, 
they continue to trend down. That implies that inflation is going to go lower as we go through this first few months, which is going to be a tailwind for markets and for the economy. The other thing is that in the forward-looking profile from many of these companies, we saw actually relative to today that they have more positive expectations. So they see actually that expansion, improvement is going to um, uh, pick up. Now, that implies that soft landing, no landing, actually have higher probabilities than that cyclical recession on that input. So we've adjusted slightly, um, soft landing up to 45% um, from it being at 20, no landing from five to 15. And that's an important one because no landing was sort of Q3 last year, which was fears of inflation staying higher, interest rate policy not coming down quickly and growth therefore uh, at some point decelerating uh, much more aggressively later. So actually, again, a bit more of a benign environment. But as you look to the second half of the year, things like fiscal impulse in the US start to roll over. Um, you know, do we see employment stay at these sort of heady levels? At the moment, no signs of real change in that. In fact, we look at indicators such as hiring and layoffs. And hiring has turned down, but layoffs have hardly moved. So you very seldom would see a recession without those crossing over. And so a number of the dynamics just said to us, we actually need to reassess what we were thinking at the beginning of Q4 to what uh, we're seeing now and, and how we should view that for the year. Well, moving from 20% to 45% soft landing, I, I, that's not small. It's, it's humongous. It's almost a doubling, as it were, mm. um, which is a nice lead on to, to my next question, actually, because we've got markets pricing in possibly as many as six Federal Reserve rate cuts this year. Mm. Do you think that that kind of pricing and the soft landing scenario are actually plausible together? So we don't see it in that form. What right. we see is that um, uh, the Federal Reserve you know, will likely, from that disinflationary uh, backdrop, because you know, what, what does it mean in practice? It means that we could well see 2% handle on core and headline inflation, maybe even be beating that going through Q2. And that will give a very positive backdrop for the Federal Reserve to, to ease policy. But to go to that level of interest rate cuts, I think you have to have something else happen, which is that the unemployment rate needs to increase, and most probably towards 4.5%. You know, why? Because all of a sudden, you know, 15 years of writing off you know, Nairu, non-accelerating inflation rate for a level of unemployment, is all of a sudden back post-COVID, because what you saw was the degree to which inflation spike, obviously coming to 21, 22, that um, that caught them by surprise. Then they're going to be very wary of having such strong employment um, to really go too far. They can take back some of that tightening with the disinflation profile, giving them a, uh, some confidence about inflation, but they're not going to go too far to re-accelerate the, the economy and the risk of inflation coming back. Okay. So if, if you think that, that I guess those two scenarios are not plausible together, are you saying so you're saying maybe less Federal Reserve rate cuts than this year? Yes, yeah, so we're looking that the profile is likely to be uh, you know, three to four 25 basis point uh, cuts. Um, the reality is that I think the only reason you would see more is that you see the economy really start to decelerate. You see unemployment going up. Then you could see that that backdrop um, provides an opportunity to be more aggressive. But at the moment, the challenge is that we're not seeing signs that that is going to you know, be part of the, the environment as we go through the next three quarters. And then meanwhile, any cuts in the, the UK or Europe <laughs> may very well be too late, possibly too late actually, in terms of avoiding a recession. You live in London. What's it going to take for these jurisdictions to crawl out of the economic slump that it might be experiencing, it is experiencing at the moment? Uh, so I, I think that um, it's a little overdone, that pessimism. Um, okay. that, um, uh, I think that uh, you know, some of the, uh, the elements of the UK are actually reasonably stable. Uh, and obviously you'd have a bias as we move into an election year, um, potentially, or certainly within the next uh, 12 months, that uh, there's going to be a degree of potential, at least mild fiscal stimulus. So the Bank of England, I think the reality is there that it will tend to move later. It will be want to see that inflation, which has been much higher, um, you know, witness in the UK come off. But the ECB as well, I think there it's in, important that um, uh, you know, some of that downturn we've seen has been in certain parts of the big economies um, and you know, certainly is not being off the radar screen for the ECB. But overall, you're actually seeing again in companies that they're doing pretty well. Um, and so 
you know, at the moment it's a, it's a difficult dynamic, but I think that the Federal Reserve cut-in allows, say, the ECB to move a little bit more quickly, but they have that cover to move because they have one target, 2% inflation target. The Fed obviously has a different mandate, uh, which one could argue can give a little bit more flexibility. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, okay, if, if you're saying then that the pessimism is maybe a little bit overdone, to, to, to put you on the spot a little bit there, does that make European companies, either from a stocks or a credit point of view, does it make it maybe more appealing than what the narrative might suggest? Yes, I think very clearly it does. And that, um, uh, you know, one of the things as well that I think is a really important uh, item that many people do not appreciate is, is actually comes down to one of the important parts that drive prices of any um, uh, uh, you know, financial asset is supply and demand. And, you know, if we look to the US, it's very interesting to see that, you know, who's been the biggest buyer of US uh, stocks, the net buyer over the last 15 years? US companies through buybacks and the like. That's slowing down. And it's obviously it's different for different companies, but the overall profile is slowing. In Europe, we've moved from where it's been for many, many years, a net issuance supply. You know, IPOs, issuance of stock have more than exceeded any um, activity to remove stock. In the last 12 months, we've seen a dramatic change, and it's almost like a mirror image where we're getting buybacks from a number of different sectors in the uh, consumer discretionary, in financials, and some of the industrials. And that is creating a very strong impulse for improvement in return on equity, coming from low multiples, good earnings profile. So I know it sounds you know, very unusual for anyone to be positive about <laughs> Europe, but actually, it's quite a good um, backstory now. Well, I'm glad to hear some optimism about European companies, and thank you for bringing that to us. So, if I can, let's come back to your outlook note. I know that soft landing and no landing probabilities have increased, but I did find it interesting when I was reading it that three particular asset classes kept cropping up, and I kind of wanted to explore the, the thesis for each, if I could. Mm -hmm. So, firstly there, you've got mid-caps, uh, I guess as highlighted as the preference in equities, US mid-caps, I should say, over small caps, and especially large and mega-cap stocks. Yeah. I guess. I'm just interested why you want to be in the middle of the market when we've seen valuations of the small land become the most tempting in something like 20 plus years. So the, the challenge around small caps is the fact that you have enormous dispersion. So really you could look at that as a space, but you're taking obviously the risk profile is different. There's a lot of companies that don't have very strong balance sheets, that don't have very strong earnings profile. Uh, you know, felt the monetary transmission really, you know, very visibly over the course of the last couple of years. So to be able to sort of gain growth, get uh, momentum might be more challenging. It's not they're unattractive. They can bounce back to agree. But mid-caps actually are in this really very good position where if you look at uh, many of them from a credit rating point of view, they sort of sit at the top of high yield. So in that... Um, uh, you know, crossover from uh, investment grade of uh, triple B uh, and also um, single A. So when you think about the full profile of refinancing, many of them have refinance coming, but they're going to get benefits from that with where we're seeing yields have come down, spreads have compressed. But also when you look at what's happened to multiple expansion, they've been left behind. Um, they've also, when you look at their earnings profile today and some of the growth that we see occur in, um, uh, you know, coming through in different sectors are very much concentrated for the mid caps, it's a very positive uh, picture. So when you do that sort of S&P 500, S&P 400 sort of profile, you have these very positive dynamics. But then there's the other point, which is that if the soft landing is going to continue to be the narrative and plays out, we have a... Uh, you know, next few months, another push towards interest rate expectations and excitement, you're going to find that people are going to look around and say, what has actually been able to keep up with this? And when you look at a long-term chart of large mega caps versus mid and small, it's been barely a blip, even though it feels like they've rallied a lot in the last few weeks, despite the recent days of setback. And so that flow through could be quite substantial if we had to see people really believe that economy is actually in good shape, disinflation is occurring, the margin benefits can be quite considerable from improving interest rate costs and earnings stay strong. That's a good place to be. Okay, so if the economy is in a better place, you increase your chance of a, of a soft landing. Where do bonds, and I guess particularly inflation-linked bonds, wh where does that now fit in the, in the allocation? Are you less interested in them because things look a little better? Well, not necessarily. So I think there's a couple of things uh, there. First, first in bonds overall, that really 
so if you think about what the dynamics um, we're looking for, we've had a little bit of a yield back up um, through the course of uh, uh, you know, coming to the year as the, as the Federal Reserve and other central bankers have tried to take out some of that um, uh, excitement. They've done that as well because financial conditions had one of the quickest improvements and largest improvements in several weeks we've seen in multiple years. So there's a degree where they're sort of trying to manage the, uh, the, the profile. But yields have backed up and gone back in the US. Um, you know, 10 years have gone comfortably above 4%. Uh, you've seen that the curve is around, so twos, tens as the, uh, the proxy for that. Uh, you know, in the just below 40 to, to 30 camp um, uh, as an inversion. And as we look forward, the, the risk is that we think that you will see the curve flattening off. So ultimately the front end uh, in yield terms declining more. That curve being around flat um, <coughs> through the months ahead and that being most probably below three and three quarters. So that implies duration is going to do reasonably well. Curve exposures can work well, but investment grade, where you're getting very well risk-adjusted spreads, actually looks pretty good. Now, if you look in the inflation market, really part of this is thinking about real yields and the um, uh, you know, profile of what you see as inflation in the medium and longer term, and, and you know, term we use in looking at break-evens. Um, and, and all of that at the moment uh, you know, does point a little bit that they can do okay, especially at the, uh, the front end, which may be a little bit of a nominal play. The risk is obviously what's happening around inflation prints. But what I think is interesting is more, you know, play the duration, play the spread. Um, when we get to that position, as you know, I'm, I'm implying, is going through the middle of the year, I think you need to look at is how far is that disinflation force going to go? What are the dynamics for, for debt and inflation and real yields as we look forward, as opposed to what is already impacted through uh, this period? that may be a better time to look that they become really very attractive um, by comparison to sort of nominal bonds. The last of the asset classes that, that interested in me, emerging markets. Uh, yes. And now emerging markets, including China, emerging markets, ex-China. Yeah. Which regions do you find the most opportunity in this area across equities and fixed income? So I think it's really interesting you sort of segmented a bit because you're quite right that, you know, one EM index, it's dominated by China, add in Taiwan, add in India, then you've got you know, over 50%, 55, 60% has been driven from that. So I do think you want to look at the uh, different uh, areas. ASEAN, we think, is very interesting because you've got great per capita income growth, you've got great demographics um, in many uh, countries, but they're also moving up the value chain. So what it means is that you're getting wealth creation, you're getting earnings um, potential is really improving for many of these countries and companies there. So that, uh, you know, is very exciting. I think you know, parts of Latin looking obviously to, to Brazil, the dynamics there are still constructive, and that really is something that reacceleration in the economy, in the global economy, you're going to see good demand for some of those um, key commodities that are there. At the moment, I think that's been, the expectations are low. So actually, that's where in some ways um, opportunity could uh, appear. But the challenge I think is, is again, is thinking about, it's, you know, these are not a, um, you know, uh, homogenous set of um, uh, you know, countries and investments, I think you really do need to, uh, to look at it uh, and think about the risks that come from, uh, from each. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you got, you got LATAM, you got ASEAN, I guess just to zone in on China specifically, and as you say, it's because it's such a large part on, on its own of the, yeah. the EM equities index. What do you make of Chinese equities, given just how far it's fallen? We've got the CSI 300 and multi-year lows. Yeah. Where, how, does that, how does that sit with you? So, um, and this is the bit in some ways that you do want to break it out because I actually yeah. think you need to focus on the fact that China is a, one of those multi-generational opportunities potentially. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we see individual companies now in what we would classify as being good sectors. So industrial, um, consumer um, related activity, even, uh, you know, intriguingly, um, that you've seen uh, tech valuations um, you know, come down quite substantially as well. Now, in the former two, we've even got companies that have no debt on their balance sheet. They're trading at three to four times earnings. And, you know, if you were to go back and, and read your Benjamin Graham um, book of uh, looking for value and long-term yeah. opportunity, this would be, in any other country over time, you'd be saying, I want to own those, those companies. I think the challenge is that obviously we have you know, two big things at play, confidence and trust in policy making uh, at the moment, and a degree of, of still what does geopolitical risk mean. 
Um, and and the, the fact that some of that is being translated into the risk of could China be in a depression almost that it's going towards. Now, we don't believe that's true because we feel that we're seeing more signs of cyclical recovery. And if that's correct, and we think that the policy makers have started to listen and they focus on consumption and demand rather than always on supply. And I think you saw actually a couple of things in very recently from some of the comments coming out that are even to look at the tax structure, that if they were to occur, they would be very distinctly positive catalysts. So I think it's, it's not something you buy, you're going to get rewarded rapidly for. But I think that if you look in the long term of can you buy an investment that, again, you do your fundamental analysis, you look at what are the, uh, the risks around that, you would be thinking that's something that I want to own. And I think that's the challenge. We're at an inflection point where I feel that's more important than the fact that sentiment over three years has, has deteriorated to the point where it's given you those opportunities. So, last question. We started this interview talking about your years in markets, your decades in markets. So what is one thing you have become privy to that you wouldn't have realized or had access to if it weren't for the position that you are in today and indeed the experience you've had all the way up to now? Indeed, do you have a view from the top? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so I think that one of the things I've been very fortunate to, to have is the access to be able to speak to so many uh, investors and to people making decisions around moving assets, but also making policy, thinking about the regulatory environment. That, that access is something I would not have if I did not have the privilege of sitting in this seat. So, you know, that's something I never underestimate the, the value of and also the opportunity to engage and learn. And that, you know, one thing I would say is that however long, you know, you're in financial markets or uh, whatever your activity, every day gives some learning experience. And every week you um, see something that builds a little bit more in your picture of how the world operates and how you can understand investment opportunity. And you should never lose sight of that. Well, I and I hope the viewers and the readers have learned a lot from this chat. Andrew McCaffrey, CIO at Fidelity International, thank you very much for joining us here at LiveWire. Thank you very much, Hans. And thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed that interview, why don't you subscribe to both the LiveWire and Market Index websites as well as our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching.